So yeah, I am Peter Runch and I'm the head of Special Collections and Archives. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the collections that's housed in Special Collections and Archives and how it relates to mapping in uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, admittedly, I am an archivist. Um, it was in my introduction and I just admitted it before you. Um, so I am really going to focus on the collecting part of, or the archival part of this particular collection. And um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you've submitted a presentation title um, for a conference and then changed your mind about what you're going to talk about. So this title, I'll try to connect it to my, uh, the, my comments, but it's, it's going to be a little bit of a stretch, I think. Anyway, so I want to start with a little bit of context because I am an archivist and I want to talk about some of the early explorers in the Grand Canyon. So up there were, uh, who we're seeing is John Wesley Powell. Everybody knows who Powell is. Um, leaping apparently across the Grand Canyon is Emery Kolb and his brother Ellsworth. These were two gentlemen that came to the Grand Canyon in the early 20th century. Emery took some of the most amazing photographs early on um, in the early 19th century of the Grand Canyon. Next to Emery there is William Wallace Bass. Um, with his foot someplace. Um, and William Wallace Bass was there in the late 19th century and early 20th century. We've heard a little bit about William and his wife Ada already. And then uh, next to William Wallace Bass there is uh, uh, George Wharton James, who is an author, um, journalist, and he wrote one of the um, early uh, hiking guides for the Grand Canyon. There are many more explorers. Those are just for that I thought I'd choose. Um, but prior to Western exploration, it needs to be acknowledged that there was indigenous activity in the Grand Canyon. And anyone who's ever hiked in the Grand Canyon sees the evidence of that activity all over the place on the trails. And many of the trails that we consider corridor trails or even routes were definitely established by Native Americans and indigenous communities. Um, and one of the things I want to kind of point out is that not only were these early explorers, and there was a lot of Native American activity in the Grand Canyon, but I think, um, and I don't think I'm stretching here, but the petroglyphs and the rock art that we see down in the Grand Canyon is definitely a form of communication and probably guidance similar to mapping. It's just not the type of mapping that we consider traditional mapping here and today. Um, so some of the early maps. Again, this isn't going to be a history of mapping of the Grand Canyon from my perspective or my thing, but I just want to show a few um, slides of early maps of the Grand Canyon. So here we have uh, the 1858 Ives expedition. And we can see the Grand Canyon up there. It's just this huge feature on this map, but there's um, very little detail associated with it. Again, this is before Powell ends up going down through the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River, so not a ton of detail. Um, this, I found this in our, our department in our holdings. Um, this is the guidebook of the Grand Canyon of Arizona, and it's um, authored by these two gentlemen named Young and uh, Bicknell. And, um, um, I'm going to have to read uh, one of the quotes, but uh, hang on, let me just find it right here. I can't quite read it without my uh, the glasses on. But um, this, this is a slightly better map, but not very much um, better. And so um, the title of the book, again, is Grand Can uh, Guidebook of the Grand Canyon of Arizona. And then it's, sub I don't know if you can see that, it's subtitled, A Volume of Interesting Facts and Gossip. Um, and on the page on the right-hand side, uh, Bicknell says, the map of the Grand Canyon here offered is an attempt to meet the constant demand of tourists who naturally wish to know something about the lay of the land. The first desire of a traveler on arriving in a new region to him is to find out where he's at. And there's no more satisfactory method for arriving at that desired knowledge than by consulting a correct map. In the next paragraph, he offers the caveat, it is not claimed that this map is absolutely correct. <laughs> so I'm not sure <laughs> what the value of that map is. Um, anyway, this is early mapping. This was published in 1901. As Dr. Upchurch mentioned in his presentation, these two guys, Francois Mathis and Evans, show up to the Grand Canyon and they survey and map the Grand Canyon. And um, I, have a, I found a great quote in um, our holdings. Um, uh, let me see, whoops. Hang on. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I found this great quote in a publication called Military Engineer in 1926, and it's the announcement um, of the Mathis Evans East Half West Half maps. And Mathis writes in this publication the United States Geological Survey has recently brought to completion one of its most difficult projects in topographic mapping which it has ever undertaken. 
the mapping of the upper half of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River in Arizona. The work was begun in 1902, long before the establishment of the National Park had been contemplated at the instance of Dr. Charles D. Walcott. And we know that Walcott spent some time at the Grand Canyon in 1901. Um, then director of the Geological Survey, who foresaw the demand that would arise for a detailed map of the Grand Canyon region, both from the public, who even at this time were flocking in numbers to see the chasm, and from the scientific world. I think that's a really important quote to keep in mind because up until this point, there are no detailed maps and Walcott is foreseeing not only the value but the, um, uh, the need for a detailed map and then the ramifications of having a detailed map like that, that people are gonna use this map and explore in the Grand Canyon, especially the public. So um, here we are, the maps. There's actually, I should have anticipated that somebody would have brought these maps. So. Um, here they are, uh, the, the Mathis Evans maps. If um, you haven't had an opportunity to see these maps, they're actually just stunning maps. Um, and one of my favorite objects that are, um, that's in our collections. Um, along comes Harvey. And here's where we get to the meat of the presentation. So Harvey Butchart, uh, for those that don't know, um, was born in 1907. Um, he comes to Flagstaff, Arizona, um, after he applied for a position at Arizona State College, which was what we used to call Northern Arizona University a long time ago. Harvey applies to become the department chair for the mathematics department and its sole member. Um, so he comes here. <laughs> he comes here in 45 with his family. And I think there, might, there may have been some professional um, interest in the position. I'm sure there was professional interest in the position. Um, but I think Harvey's really interested in um, a couple of other things. There's some personal drivers that are bringing Harvey and his family out to the Grand Canyon. First, his daughter has asthma, and he thought that the dry climate, uh, dry and arid climate of the Southwest would be beneficial for her. So there's that point. The second point was that Harvey's beginning to hike in the Colorado 14ers during his summer break. So he's starting to hike and explore already. And this job is conveniently located very close to the Colorado 14ers, but it's also close to the Grand Canyon. So there were many different uh, factors that were definitely influencing Harvey in accepting this position at Arizona State College. So here's one of the first photographs, if not the first photograph, of Harvey in the Grand Canyon. So what does everyone do when they move to Flagstaff? They go up to the Grand Canyon. They either hang out at the South Rim and take it all in, or those who are more ambitious will hike it. So Harvey's one of the more ambitious folks. He takes his family down. And this is a picture of Harvey on the South Kaibab Suspension Bridge. And I just love the way that Harvey's dressed right there. And that's pretty much the way Harvey ends up hiking the Grand Canyon um, for quite some time. I mean, he typically wears khaki pants, work boots, a shirt, and maybe a jacket if it's cool. This is a, a great photograph, but it's also um, an important slide too. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I think the resolution may be off a little bit on this, but um, that's Harvey um, climbing Wutan's throne. He's tied in. Um, the person at the other end of the rope is Emery Kolb. And at first I didn't realize this, but I looked at this photograph and I'm like, he's belaying Harvey Butchart and taking a photograph at the same time. And this is long before we had little cameras. So I don't know what that says about both of them, but Harvey seems to be happy. So why does Harvey matter? Harvey matters for a couple different reasons. Um, Harvey um, begins hiking in the Grand Canyon and he creates this amazing map and we'll see a version of Harvey's map, uh, Mathis Evans map in just a moment. But one of the things that Harvey's doing is he's documenting his activities in the Grand Canyon. And this is really important. Harvey's also um, one of the first kind of recreational or casual explorers of the Grand Canyon. He's taking advantage of the Mathis Evans map just as Walcott was predicting. And he's going to go out and he's going to explore beyond just those corridor trails and routes. And so Harvey matters because um, he's in this first generation of these um, relatively, uh, I don't know, like casual or recreational explorers, but they're not being directed like Washburn was. They're not being funded by like Washburn was or um, Powell or any of the other early explorers, Birdseye. These are people that are going out there and exploring for their own personal enjoyment. And one of the things that Harvey's doing that's really important for us, all of us here actually, is that he's documenting all of his activities in the Grand Canyon. So it's super, super important. Um, but Harvey is a mathematician, remember, and he loves his numbers. And um, Harvey has quite a few numbers. Many of you guys may already know some of these numbers. Um, 
So Harvey ends up spending 42 years exploring the Grand Canyon. And it's important to know that Harvey comes here in 1945, 1946. He's hiking a little bit the first 10 years. He's doing two or three hikes a year. But after, he, do, he doesn't start really hiking vigorously and with great verve and gusto until the late 1950s. So Harvey's 50 years old when he starts all this stuff. He ends up spending 42 years exploring the Grand Canyon. In those 42 years, he hikes 12 thousand miles that's halfway around the circumference of the, the earth he spent over 1,000 days below the rim discovered 164 routes through the redwall limestone also discovered 116 rim to river routes climbed 83 buttes and temples 28 being first ascents and over the course of a 17 year period harvey becomes the first person documented to do a um, hike from one end of the grand canyon to the other end All right, so Harvey's early influences. George Horton James, there's the, the cover of the book, In and Around the Grand Canyon. Uh, George Horton James um, lists about 15 hikes in that Grand Canyon. When you look at Harvey's logs and line up those early hikes against the index of the hikes that um, George Horton James um, identifies in his book, the similarity is pretty uncanny. Um, he's definitely looking at this book. The second book in the middle of the slide there is kind of a compilation of articles and chapters written by uh, various people, one of whom is Eddie McKee. So Inverted Mountains was a really important text for Harvey, and he was really focused on Eddie's, um, Eddie McKee's um, chapters because Eddie was strictly talking about the Grand Canyon. And then um, that third piece is a map fragment, and that is the upper right-hand corner of Harvey Butcher's Mathis Evans East Half West Half Maps. And I don't know if you guys can read it, but uh, it says, um, I think the quote is, um, red lines are roots incomplete of Merrill Clubs. Merrill Club was another faculty member, not at Arizona State College, but at the University of Kansas. He taught medieval literature there. And in the summer times, Merrill Club would come out to the Grand Canyon and encamp himself on the North Rim and do some of the most obscure, rugged routes off the North Rim early, early. He was about 10, 15 years Harvey Sr. So he was out and about exploring. I think the similarities between Merrill Club and um, Harvey Butcher were not lost on Harvey. And Harvey, um, we can see right here that Harvey is a competitive soul as well as uh, um, a mathematician. I think he's trying to, um, with this little quote, um, I think he's trying to um, achieve exactly what Merrill Club did and then outdo Merrill Club. But definitely Merrill's one of his early influences. Okay, so here's Harvey's map. I hope you guys can see this, but it's the Mathis Evans East Half West Half map with 12,000 miles worth of lines on that map. And each line is a story. Each line has a history. This is an amazing source of information for anyone interested in exploring the Grand Canyon by foot. Um, so I was doing a little bit of research looking around. I wanted to see where we could find. So that map is digitized and available on the Colorado Plateau Digital Archives. I wanted to see where else it was available. So it's available on Wikimedia Commons, and I'm not even sure what that is. Um, <laughs> but the cool thing is that they had a little copyright notice and said, hey, this object may be copyrighted. And I'm like, that's awesome. Somebody's going to cite us. Um, and so I click on it, and it's not us who gets cited. It's the National Park Service. And I was like, oh yeah, of course. So the person that took this photograph, this is a photograph of copies of Harvey's maps. The reason there are copies of Harvey's maps is because people come to special collections and archives or they go online and they look at the, the logs and the maps and they figure, well, this guy just taught math. Uh, how hard can this possibly be? And so they go and they try to replicate some of Harvey's hikes and inevitably these people get lost or stuck wherever they are, and the National Park Service has to go rescue them. So they worked with the Klein Library to get copies of these maps up there to help with the search and rescue. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of cool. I'm sure a lot of you guys were at the Grand Canyon History Symposium last weekend. I was supposed to be up there. I wasn't able to make it. Um, Tom Myers shared, um, at the symposium, he shared two film clips. He also shared them with me so I could share them with you down here. This first film clip is a film clip taken by a guy named Ron Mitchell. 
and Ron Mitchell was a hiker in the Grand Canyon in the 70s and the 80s, and he brought down one of those Super 8 cameras and he was taking film footage. And this is the only known film footage of Harvey hiking in the Grand Canyon. So let's see if I can get this to, to go. So there he is, khaki pants. He's got his little do-rag on, his work boots. There's Ron Mitchell next to him, and there he goes. And that's cool. That's Harvey in his element. And it doesn't look like he's moving fast, but if you ever look at his logs, he also notes the time that it takes to do certain hikes or to go from one feature to another. Harvey's moving pretty fast. I mean, I think he probably averaged a 12 to 15 minute mile pace in the Grand Canyon. And there he goes. There we go. All right, so the maps are amazing documents in themselves or artifacts. Um, but complementing these maps are two really important pieces of documentation. The first is Harvey's logs. As I mentioned a moment ago, like Harvey um, was just kind of dabbling in Grand Canyon hiking for the first 10 years while I was in Flagstaff area. It's not until a little bit later that he starts to really get into it. And so he starts keeping pretty serious logs, or I should say, starts keeping fairly detailed logs in the late 1950s. And this is, I think, page six of the earliest logs. And I've highlighted two passages here on this page. One, to show that um, he's, uh, this first highlighted passage on the top is actually Harvey trying to do a hike out of the George Wharton James in and around the Grand Canyon book. It's the Hopi Salt Trail. He's going down there. He'd gotten some information from another guy named Doc Marston. He doesn't trust Doc's uh, information, and so Harvey decides to go out on his own and inevitably does not find the cave that he was looking for. It's not until two months later on the next page we learn that he goes down again with Alan Curtin, and indeed they find it once they pay attention to Doc's information. The second piece that's highlighted down there, and this is great that both of these things are kind of on the same page in the hiking logs, is um, Harvey's, like one of the, there are two like huge natural barriers in the Grand Canyon, the Red Wall, and then the river. I mean, those are the things that are going to stop most average hikers from doing just about anything they want to do in the canyon. And so Harvey, like, pioneered all these routes to the Red Wall, but he wants to get across the river because this is going to save him tons of time. He doesn't have to drive all the way around. So Harvey devises this idea to blow up an air mattress, which he was probably bringing already, and then he's going to paddle himself across the river. This sounds awesome. It sounds like a really good idea. So Harvey would, like, strip down throws his stuff in his backpack, wraps it up in plastic, puts the backpack back on, then gets in onto his air mattress and starts paddling across the river. And this works for Harvey. I mean, this becomes Harvey's, one of his signature or hallmark uh, methods of crossing the river. I don't advise it um, for a couple different reasons. <laughs> um, the river doesn't look like it's moving fast when you're down there but it kind of is. And so here's another clip um, from Ron Mitchell via Tom Myers. And um, I just want to show you. So here's Ron Mitchell definitely being influenced by Harvey, but putting his own twist on this. And so Ron's a bit of a ham. Okay, so he's got his gear on an air mattress, but he's doing something a little different. He's got a piece of foam. If I'm his hiking companion, I, I tell him, you go first, <laughs> if you make it. <laughs> this just looks so precarious. All right, so here he goes. That water's cold. This is, even though this is, I don't think this is pre dam this is post dam He's going, he's going, he hits the current, and watch this. Whoosh. Pan out, there's where, oh, there it goes, there it goes. Anyway, I'm running out of time. I want to keep going. Um, he, he makes it across. Um, it's, <laughs> 
All right, so, um, so I talked about the logs, I talked about the maps, the real, and I think it was Michael Fry that may have mentioned this, um, correspondence is one of the, the juiciest parts of any collection. Most archivists um, and historians and scholars want to go right into the correspondence because that's where it's going. I think it was um, Nicholas that kind of mentioned, be careful what you write in correspondence or in emails. Um, but Harvey's pretty candid. Um, he writes to all these people looking for additional information on hikes, routes, um, mysteries, anything that he, um, is interested in the Grand Canyon. Here's a list of just a few of the people he corresponded with, like going from left to right, um, upper to lower, we got P.T. Riley, Joseph Hall, Emery Kolb, George Billingsley, who's in the audience, Doc Marston, Dan and Don Davis, Fred Eisman, and Jim Ullman. These are just some of the folks he corresponded with. Um, the person he corresponded the most with was P.T. Riley. He corresponded with P.T. Riley for over 30 years, averaging about two letters. This is before email, two letters a month, sometimes more. And these guys are exchanging really important information about their previous hikes. For those of you who don't know who P.T. Riley is, he was a river runner in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He ended up um, researching a book on Lee's Ferry, and it was published posthumously. Um, but he's suggesting here in the correspondence for Harvey to start maintaining logs, taking photos, and to write some trail guides. And that may have been the seed for three of Harvey's most well-known publications, Grand Canyon Treks, Grand Canyon Treks II, and Grand Canyon Treks III, published between 70 and 84. So how does Harvey end up in the archives? Harvey ends up in the archives through serendipity. Um, Harvey and his wife, Roma, loved to play bridge. And they played bridge with other faculty members, one of the uh, other faculty couples he played with. Um, that didn't sound right. Um, one of the faculty couples that he played bridge with, um, his wife was a special collections um, librarian at the time. Her name um, was Jane Julian. And Jane, um, uh, Jane was uh, um, noticing that Harvey was really interested in the Grand Canyon. We're building this um, collection of information on the Colorado Plateau. So Jane definitely is asking Harvey and talking to Harvey early on about donating his stuff to uh, the, um, the Klein Library. 1968, he starts donating material, and so he donates material from 68 for about another 10 years. Um, so that's how we end up with the material. Again, the, rich, the richness of the collection is much deeper than just the map. 6,000 slides that he took across, um, over those 42 years, all of those slides have been digitized and available online. The correspondence files that I talked about, and of course, the original trip logs that he uh, maintained. So one of the big things that Harvey was trying to do, like he was looking for patterns on his map, and one of the patterns that he, he started to look for, and this is why it took him 17 years to go from one end of the Grand Canyon to the other, was to connect these hikes. And so he wanted to start connecting the lines. I want to use that as a metaphor, because Harvey's collection comes to us in 1968. But shortly thereafter, we can start seeing the influence of Harvey on other uh, people that are depositing stuff in our collection. So, we, got Eddie Mc we have a little bit of material from Eddie McKee. Michael Fry um, knows that we have the Bradford Wa Washburn material um, uh, regarding the mapping of the Bright Angel. Dan and Don Davis, George Billingsley, and Peter Huntoon. Um, George and Peter wrote an amazing, or not wrote, they created an amazing geological map of the Grand Canyon. Um, Bob Euler was an archaeologist. Amory Cole, Fred Eisman there with the pipe rowing the boat. Um, Joseph Hall, a biologist, P.T. Riley, and then in the corner in the lower right-hand side is Mary um, K. Allen, and she was the one that, she was a river runner interested in um, documenting uh, rock art and petroglyphs in the Grand Canyon. So what does this all mean? Like you, you spend 42 years in the Grand Canyon, a thousand days hiking below the rim, you, you know, 12,000 miles, you get a butte named after you. That's all it takes. And so Harvey's Butte, Butchart Butte, is uh, located on the eastern side of the Grand Canyon. It's kind of in between uh, Jessup Point and Siegfried Pyre. Um, Harvey never climbed his butte. Um, he got really close, he did Siegfried Pyre. But um, yeah, he never actually climbed it. And so um, I'm gonna wrap up because I have less than a minute to go. I do wanna thank some people. Of course, Harvey Butchart for donating all this material. Jane Julian for helping steward that material there. Tom Myers for sharing those film clips. George Billingsley for going out to coffee with me and telling me Harvey Butchard stories. And then, of course, Matt for inviting me down here and all of Matt's colleagues who put this on. I really appreciate being invited down here and having the opportunity to share a little bit of our history with you. So thank you all. <laughs>